Uh, it's my great pleasure to now introduce Dirk Derrida. Uh, Dirk's been a previous uh, presenter at our conferences and uh, I've always uh, listened to him in earnest uh, about his work with uh, um, TDCS and uh, tinnitus. Uh, Dirk uh, is a professor of neurosurgery at the Dunedin School of Medicine at the uh, University of Otago in New Zealand and runs a private clinic in Belgium. He's also associated with the Nan uh, Manipal University in India and teaches at the University of Bonn in Germany. I don't know how many hours he spends on a plane per year, but it sounds like a lot. Uh, his research is based on two pillars, network science and Bayesian brain uh, concepts um, uh, as a way to reduce inherently um, uncertainty in changing environments. So phantom percepts are seen as maladaptive network phenomenon due to deficient updating resulting from sensory deafferation. So trauma and PTSD can be approached from a Bayesian perspective. His main research interest is the understanding and treatment of phantom percepts, such as uh, tinnitus and pain, especially by the use of uh, non-invasive techniques, such as TMS, TADS, uh, TACS, TRNS, Loretta Neurofeedback, and also through invasive implants, neuro neuromodulation techniques. The approach to unravel phantom percepts is by developing an understanding of comodalities in different diseases, such as thermal cortical dysrhythmias in pain, tinnitus, Parkinson's disease, slow wave epilepsy, and re, uh, reward deficiency syndromes. So this has led him to develop novel treatment approaches for neurological and psychiatric disorders. So he's developed burst and noise sim simulation stimulation as novel uh, designs for implants and is currently working on multifocal or network stimulation, uh, which he has commercialized with Abbott. He's written 400 book chapters and more than 300 PubMed listed journal articles. Uh, more than 170 articles relate to network approaches for brain disorders. So today, um, Dirk will be, his abstract is on trauma, neuroinflammation and psychedelic neuromodulation, the path forward. I'd like to ask you all to welcome Dirk and uh, thank you for coming and sharing with us your knowledge. Okay, good, uh, good day, everybody. Um, I will share my screen and try to um, explain to you how in the uh, clinic in Belgium, we treat um, PTSD and how we, um, and what's the theoretical background for it. Um, so one of the um, starting points is of course, how a brain works so that we can treat it from a, a very pragmatic point of view. And ultimately we've developed a brain to um, relate to the outside world. And so in order to survive and procreate um, and relate to a changing environment, uh, which uh, results in uncertainty that is embedded in a changing environment. Now, if we want to communicate with an environment or with the outside world, there is uh, basically two ways. One is via the nervous system. So our brain predicts what it's going to encounter in the, in the environment. And we have developed senses to then verify whether that prediction is right or, or wrong. Now, there is also a second way to communicate with the outside world, and that's via the immune system that will detect bacteria, viruses, fungi, etc. And so it has been suggested that actually our immune system might nothing might be nothing more than a sixth sense, um, and that it allows our brain to detect bacteria, viruses, fungi, just like it would detect light, sound, um, 
taste, etc. And this fits with the idea that actually our nervous system might have developed as a way in very simple animals like um, cnidaria, like uh, uh, coon jellies and jellyfish, to actually distinguish good bacteria, which could be used as food or as a commensal uh, bacteria from danger, uh, dangerous bacteria, meaning pathogenic bacteria. And also then subsequently not just detecting uh, good from bad bacteria, but also how to engage with them um, in a uh, protective way um, or using them as food or to fight and flight. Uh, response to them. Now, since our brain is a predictive system, um, the environment should not be completely random because otherwise predictions are useless. Predictions only make sense if there is recurring uh, patterns, re recurring statistical regularities in the environment. And, and we know these exist, for example, the day-night cycle, seasons, tidal um, tides. Um, they're all predictable, um, even though day and night cycles do change throughout the seasons, but that means that uh, we can update these uh, predictions by using our senses. So our eyes will pick up light and darkness, and that might then influence our genetic responses um, to those changes. So, and this is also why from all our genes, about 50%, are expressed within 24 hour rhythms. So certain genes are activated at night, some others during the day. And the reason is actually very simple is that we have um, a couple of organs that consume a huge amount of energy like our brain, which consumes about 20%, 25% of our total energy. The immune system uh, consumes 20% of our, um, our uh, total energy balance as, as do our heart, lungs, and internal organs. And on top of that, when we move around, we consume some extra energy um, to mobilize our muscles. So from a practical point of view, our um, body has developed a system where normally during the day, we use predominantly our nervous system and, and metabolism. And during the night, we um, activate our immune system as well as our repair and growth system. So. How do we know this? Well, for example, around eight, eight o'clock in the evening, we'll have the highest levels of uh, neutrophils or white blood cells. And around two, between two and four o'clock at night, we'll have um, the peak of our lymphocytes. So our immune system is predominantly active at night. And then in the morning, we, act, we have a high release of cortisol that will stop our immune system so that most of the energy can go to our nervous system. And then in the evening, we will get some, um, uh, again, more activation of our immune and repair system. So from a practical point of view, during the day, our, um, our brain is active and during the night, our immune system, because otherwise, if we would have to co-activate everything all the time, that might just be too energy uh, expensive. And so then it already, um, tells you that if you have insomnia, for example, uh, which has a very uh, two out of three patients with PTSD have insomnia, that that might disrupt your immune system, which could be problematic uh, with regards to uh, continuation of the or chronification of fear into PTSD. So we relate to the outside world um, via our nervous system and immune system, but these two actually also interact with the endocrine system. And so uh, our brain communicates via neurotransmitters to the immune system and the endocrine system. The immune system communicates to the brain and the endocrine system via cytokines, and the endocrine system communicates to the brain via hormones as well as to the immune system. So the nervous system tends to be fast and very specific via connections, which we call nerves, whereas the endocrine system is a little bit slower, but has a more general effect by releasing its uh, signal molecules into the bloodstream. Now, some of these mo signal molecules are can be both hormones and neurotransmitters. For example, noradrenaline and adrenaline can, when they're released in the bloodstream, are called hormones, and when they're released uh, via uh, neurons, uh, then they're called neurotransmitters. So in fact, this um, 
the semantic distinction between hormones, cytokines, and neurotransmitters doesn't really make a lot of sense, and we might just call them signal molecules that permit interactions between our nervous system, immune system, and endocrine system. Therefore, it should also not be surprising if we really develop the nervous system to detect good from bad bacteria that um, and uh, from pathogenic and non-pathogenic bacteria that some of our neurotransmitters are actually pro or anti-inflammatory. For example, serotonin is anti-inflammatory, dopamine is pro-inflammatory, and that some cytokines actually can uh, create uh, behavioral changes such as uh, sickness behavior, where when um, pro-inflammatory cytokines are released, um, that that will generate sleep, fatigue, social and sexual withdrawal, anorexia, etc. And this might just be because um, the immune system wants to uh, save energy by shutting down the brain uh, transiently uh, in order to have enough energy to uh, recover. But it also means that some hormones, of course, influence your immune system and your nervous system. And a clear example is cortisol that shuts down your, um, your immune response, but so does testosterone, eustrogen, thyroid hormone, and glucagon. So what it means is that those signal molecules actually are not as specific or limited to one um, system as is often um, thought. Now, brains are both electrical and chemical. So when an electrical stimulus arrives at the, at the synapse, it releases a chemical that will then be uh, picked up by the next neuron. And initially, that was very simple. There was just uh, in the first, in the first um, unicellular um, living um, organisms, there was just a break and an accelerator. So... Uh, for example, coanoflagellates, which are unicellular uh, eukaryotes that later become part of sponges, actually only have a brake and an accelerator. But then later on, uh, there was also um, other neurotransmitters or signal molecules that modified the all or non-reflexive response of um, the brake and the accelerate, for example, serotonin will modify your uh, break response and uh, dopamine will modify your glutamatergic response. So there is some kind of dimmer system on this uh, all or nothing uh, reflexive system. So you could compare that to shifting down um, the, the gears in your car if you want to slow it down or accelerating by uh, changing gears. And these, uh, these molecules, these neurotransmitters or signal molecules are very important because some of them um, do modify which brain network is actually going to become active. For example, serotonin will predominantly um, activate your default mode network, uh, which is a self-representational network that is active when you're um, quietly um, um, reflecting about the past or the future or mind wandering. Um, and dopamine will activate your salience network, which is another network that is involved in detecting whether something behaviorally relevant, relevant is uh, present in the environment. And the dopamine will shut down your default mode. And this makes sense because let's say you're mind wandering, so your default mode network is active and somebody calls your name or shouts fire, then your salience network becomes active it, uh, and then it will go and try and look for um, where the fire is and, and what is the solution to the problem. And in order to do so, it's, it, of course, has to shut down your mind wandering and activate your central executive network, which is then uh, going to kickstart your goal-oriented behavior in order to deal with what is behaviorally relevant. So what are those brain networks now that we have uh, to interact with the self and environment. Those networks um, are predominantly, of course, related to a predictive uh, brain, where your brain will, uh, based on a certain intention in a specific context, will predict what stimuli to expect in, in a certain situation. 
Um, it will then actively go and look in the environment for that stimulus that it predicts to be there. For example, of course, if you're in a war zone, you will try and look for the enemy. And then um, you use your senses to verify whether that prediction is correct or not correct. And then if the prediction is correct, meaning that uh, you, you have that there is no uncertainty in the environment, then basically you can um, um, uh, activate your parasympathetic rest and digest and resource system. However, if the prediction is wrong, there is an inherent uncertainty in the environment that has to be dealt with and that will, that will react, that will result in an activation or a fight uh, and flight response. So, um, from an evolutionary point of view, if you look at, at the areas in the brain that control your sympathetic nervous system, that involves the dorsal part of the anterior cingulate, um, cortex, your insula, and these two are the main hubs of your salience network that I've just discussed, which detects uh, environmental behaviorally relevant changes. So what is a change? Basically, a change is a prediction error, because if you predict correctly, then there is no prediction error, and then you, your brain knows exactly what it is doing um, um, in, the, in that moment. Now, if, you're, if your brain has made a prediction and there is a prediction error, that will, by definition, be salient. And also, if you look at your sympathetic nervous system control in the brain, it also involves the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex parietal area and um, occipital temporal junction. And this is your central executive network, which intuitively makes sense. So from a practical point of view, your sympathetic nervous system has evolved um, into the salience network and the central executive network. Now, if the prediction is right, um, for example, your brain predicts uh, that your clothes will be there, then of course it will say, well, I, I, these prediction, this prediction is correct, so I don't have to do anything special. I don't have to even push it in, uh, to the level of consciousness. And then your parasympathetic system can be activated. And the main hub of your parasympathetic system is the posterior cingulate cortex and your left, um, left insula, as well as um, part of your uh, hippocampus, um, and, uh, hippocampus and left amygdala. And your default mode in, in the brain, your, rest, your resting state network is actually overlapping with the parasympathetic nervous system. So from a practical point of view, we've got a self-related default mode network and an environmental related uh, central executive network. And it's your salience network that will determine um, whether your um, default or central executive network becomes active. Now, these networks are genetically coded for, as well as the interactions between those networks. So those um, you have your, your genetically coded, which also means that these genes can be either uh, different uh, between people um, or can uh, become expressed differently via epigenetic factors. So the salience network will determine uh, whether you can just stay in a rest and digest uh, uh, mode and mind wander mode, or whether you have to re, uh, respond to an external stimulus, which is environment, environmentally um, relevant. So, and as mentioned, it overlaps with your parasympathetic and your sympathetic nervous system. And these two, default and central executive network are anti-correlated, meaning if one is active, the other one is suppressed. It is the salience network that drives the default mode network, which makes sense because um, it's uh, when you're mind wandering, some, some system has to overrun your mind wandering and it um, therefore switches, helps switching between the default mode and the central executive network. Now, these, these interactions are constantly changing, and that can be adaptive uh, or, unfortunately, also maladaptive. So when, um, when there is uncertainty in the environment, meaning that your brain is in a state in which uh, a given representation of the world 
cannot be used as a, as a way to uh, guide your behavior, um, thoughts or emotions, then this uncertainty leads to stress. And stress can be defined just as, an, as a state of uncertainty uh, where your brain doesn't really know what to do to maintain your physical, mental or social well-being. So, and if you look at a meta-analysis, it's, it's unsurprising, of course, that your uncertainty is processed by a combination of your, um, of your uh, salience network by in anterior insula and ACC extending into the S SMA, as well as a central executive network, which involves dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex parietal area and occipital temporal junction. So of course, when, when your brain has to do something to resolve this uncertainty, it will activate your SANES network and central executive network. So if there is uncertainty in the environment, uh, meaning if there is that, that results in a stress, in, uh, as a, uh, results in a stressor um, response in your brain, that will predominantly uh, based on a meta-analysis, um, activate your salience network. And it will also induce some connectivity changes. Now, when there's acute stress, which is adaptive, because it just then switches on your central executive network to solve the stress, um, when this becomes chronic, that means that you're not very well resol resolving the uncertainty, then there is some changes occurring in the brain. So the, the, um, the central executive network actually shuts down in chronic stress and you get active as well as the pregenital anterior singlet cortex uh, as part of your default mode and your hippocampus also as part of your default mode. Um, but you get hyper um, activity of your amygdala and your orbitofrontal cortex as well as your uh, striatum, your, which means your putamen and, and your caudate nucleus. So basically, instead of only the, so two of the three classical uh, cognitive networks actually shut down in chronic stress and you get activation of your, um, of your affective or emotional network. And unfortunately in chronic stress, you also get an inflammatory response to which I'll come back later. But ultimately, if this chronic stress is maintained for too long a time, then that might lead to exhaustion. And this exhaustion is then, is then ultimately results in a mental disorder. So, and this is why a lot of stress-related mental disorders like um, depression, anxiety, OCD, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder are associated with an atrophy of your salience network. I mean, the network that has been active too long and too much. And so you'll get uh, atrophy of your insula and your pregenital anterior signal cortex, which is common to all those disorders. Now, not only the activity changes, but also the connectivity changes. So when there is little stress or a lot of stress, your uh, that's what that changes the connectivity. But pre what's very important is that if there is toxic stress, so a very severe stress, then your salience network actually disconnects from both the um, default mode and your um, and your central executive network. So basically, your brain doesn't really know what to do anymore, um, and it will. Uh, um, get the information then from the um, amygdala. Um, so the em your emotions will, uh, will tell you basically what to do. And the connectivity changes in those, um, um, when the stress becomes too toxic and too long, this connectivity changes then uh, results in pathology. The pathology, which is, uh, uh, which can be anxiety, depression, um, HDHD, autism, OCD, PTSD, schizophrenia. What is interesting is that all have a common um, dysfunctional pattern. Basically, what happens is that your default mode network falls apart in, in an anterior system and a posterior system. And the anterior system, so your pregenital anterior singlet cortex, which is the general inhibition or is capable of inhibiting uh, stimuli uh, will become less connected to the salience network and uh, the salience network will be less connected to the frontoparietal network. 
and the posterior, so the uh, posterior cingulate cortex will become hyperconnected to your rostral part of the anterior cingulate cortex and also to the frontoparietal network. So you get both hypoconnectivity of the anterior default mode and the posterior hyperconnectivity. Now, when this, when this um, stress is uh, maintained for too long, then that results in a low-grade inflammation. And this low-grade inflammation will actually change the connections between those three cardinal um, cognitive networks, the default mode network, the sense network, and the central executive network. So they will communicate less efficiently to each other, which is also what you see in a stress response. But then a stress response, it's predominantly the default mode, um, the sense network, and the sensory networks that are uh, changing. And that makes sense. When, when you're in stress, every stimulus can be important. So the sense network just activates all your senses to be processing whatever information is there because any kind of information could be problem, could be beneficial. And if you, of course, have a combination of this low-grade inflammation and stress, then that will predominantly modify the interactions between default mode central executive and uh, savings network as we've seen uh, before. So if we put that together um, and we add some, some extra information, then the um, when depending on your ge genetic buildup of both your immune uh, system and your nervous system, as well as environmental factors like psychological stress, physical stress, trauma, but especially childhood adversity, but also toxins that could be uh, present in the environment, certain medications, or even a diet that might that might result in uh, both microbiomic changes, but also in epigenetic modifications. So what does that mean? It means that you might have normal genes, um, but they the expression of those genes might be um, might be changed by these environmental factors. And that could result in a low-grade neuroinflammatory state. And this neuroinflammatory state then makes you vulnerable for fear to become uh, anxiety, sadness to become depression, stress to become PTSD, pain to become chronic pain, tinnitus to become chronic uh, tinnitus. So it, it might be the neuro, the pro-inflammatory um, state that turns a, um, a normal adaptive response into a maladaptive uh, chronification of that response. And if you, and if you um, are lucky by having a good genetic buildup or um, haven't been exposed to trauma, stress, or childhood adversity, then you might actually not develop this neuroinflammatory state and become resilient. So... Bring on. Apologize, my seems like I am locked, so I will quickly try and reshare. That is strange. Sorry for this. For one another reason, my PowerPoint got yes. Sorry for that. Uh, so chronic stress then results in certain pathologies, not just the depression and anxiety that we've seen, but it's also known that it uh, modifies uh, your cardiovascular uh, system. And we all know that that chronic stress can lead to hypertension and uh, dysrhythmia problems, but also it can worsen um, infectious diseases as well as uh, result in cancer progression. And the reason is, as we've seen uh, before, that if you've got a stressor that will create changes in your interactions between your default mode, central executive system, salience network, and if it becomes chronic, actually engage your uh, emotional network. But second of all, it will also 
um, modify your endocrine system by releasing uh, glucocorticoid hormones, which will then uh, result in a decrease of your immune system, which can then result in progression of pathologies, uh, infectious pathologies and cancer. And also it will release uh, your noradrenaline and adrenaline, which can then um, result, of course, in, hyperten in hypertension, uh, but also uh, if prolonged in, uh, in anxiety. Furthermore, the sympathetic nervous system will, uh, will modify activity in your lymph nodes, which will then also change your immune response. So if you have a, a chronic stress, what will happen is that, of course, your salience network that we've seen, which is overactive all the time, um, becomes exhausted. And so you get hypoactivity in your anterior insula, as well as um, your rostral part of the anterior singlet. But furthermore, your central executive network um, will also become hypoactive, uh, meaning your dorsal anterior singlet cord, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, as well as your parietal area. The only area that becomes hyperactive uh, permanently um, is your dorsal anterior singlet cortex. And so when these areas become hypoactive, they also connect less. And that's why the uh, frontal parietal central executive network, which is uh, hypoactive, actually communicates less with the salience network uh, uh, predominantly with the insula and the anterior default mode network, um, which is hypoactive as well, actually communicates less with the salience network. And the hyperactive area then actually um, induces a hyperconnectivity with the posterior singlet cortex, which still functions normally, um, is not hypo, not hyperactive, and connects from there to the, um, to the uh, central executive network. Now, which is uh, hypoactive, so is dysfunctional. And that's why stress disorders are actually associated because of this prolongation with an atrophy of your um, salience network. Now, what's PTSD? Um, well, you, you all know that because you all treat uh, probably with uh, patients with PTSD. PTSD is characterized by uh, reliving the, uh, the traumatic experience in flashbacks and bad dreams. Uh, of course, um, a behavior that is characterized by avoidance of anything that reminds the, the patient of the trauma, um, thinking of the trauma, talking about the trauma, places associated with the trauma, activities that might be related to trauma, and also a, 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 a constant a sense of threat, um, which results in hyper arousal, so hypersympathetic activity, which uh, means that that those patients are very easily frightened, are always on their guard, or having problems sleeping, etc. Now, these three core symptoms: uh, reliving, avoidance, and hyper arousal can actually also uh, be associated with other uh, problems like a feeling of worthlessness, uh, shame or guilt, as well as uh, changes in interactions where people become uh, emotionally very um, uh, reactive with violent outbursts, aggressivity um, and dissociative states under stress, as well as and, uh, problems uh, maintaining relations. And this is especially common when there is a uh, repeated uh, trauma or when um, the trauma occurs in childhood, uh, whether that is due to childhood abuse, whether they're, um, what they're, they also occur, of course, in child sol soldiers um, or in people who are um, repetitively exposed to, um, to trauma, like in slave trade, sex trafficking, uh, genocides, etc. So a single, um, a single trauma might result in a traditional um, PTSD, whereas repetitive or um, prolonged trauma might actually result in complex uh, PTSD. Now, interestingly, complex PTSD actually overlaps partially with borderline personality disorder, um, where they have some uh, similar symptoms. So, which means that a single trauma results in traditional uh, PTSD, uh, re repetitive or uh, prolonged trauma in a complex PTSD, which is traditional PTSD, 
plus some um, affect dysregulation as well as interpersonal relationship problems, which overlap with borderline personality. And that's not so surprising, unsurprising actually, because uh, more than 80% of people with borderline personality disorder have uh, childhood trauma. So um, PTSD is prevalent. Uh, normally in uh, lifetime prevalence is about 5%, but it depends on the country that you live in. Um, women, unfortunately, tend to experience PTSD more frequently and more intensely. And irrespective of the trauma, whether it's major traumatic events like the, like the, like disasters, floods, war zones, or even um, a pandemic, um, trauma actually all result in about 20% uh, prevalence, which means there is 80% that do not develop PTSD. And, and what does that mean? Does it mean that we can learn something from it from a treatment point of view? Because if we can make people resilient, then we might treat them for PTSD. So resilience uh, means the, the capacity of any dynamic system. And now we're talking about the brain, but it's also applicable. The word is also applicable to any system. Um, to, um, to adapt successfully to disturbances that threaten the function, the stability and viability of um, any system. So basically it means that uh, if you're resilient, that you're able to cope um, with stress, uh, trauma, adversity without any long-term negative consequences. And you can measure this using different questionnaires. And this is dependent on your genetics. So. Um, for example, CERT or um, um, SLC6A4 genes, um, uh, dopamine, uh, D4 receptors, BDNF, oxytocin receptors, uh, glucocorticoid receptors. Um, so basically, you have uh, you can have good genes basically that protect you from being sensitive to stress, but also epigenetically modifications. And so what epigenetic modifications means is that you uh, that similar genes are methylated or changed because of experience, traumatic experiences and um, or child adversity um, that will modify, um, even if you don't have those risk genes that can make them those genes more sensitive for future trauma. Now, uh, what what is the neurological basis for um, for resilience? It's mean the neurological basis is a normal or healthy functioning and a good connected uh, central executive network. So if your central executive network is nice, well connected, then that um, that makes you resilient. And one the reason is that if your dorsolateral prefrontal cortex can suppress your hippocampus, then a trauma. Um, it's not relived, it doesn't result in flashbacks, etc. Now, it's not only the connectivity in the central executive, also how your pregenital anterior singlet cortex is capable of, um, of connecting to the central executive network and the uh, anterior default mode network. So that's also important. So it's the central executive network, how it relates to the pregenital anterior singlet, and the pregenital anterior singlet cortex is uh, the starting point of a network that inhibits further input. So, if you put that in in a conceptual framework, and then it means that resilience is nothing more than the capacity that you have to inhibit irrelevant stimuli and and uh, uh, launch goal oriented behavior. Because if you can't inhibit um, those stimuli, when everything is too important, then you get confused and you don't know what to do or how to solve a problem. So the resilient brain is critically dependent on how your pregenital anterior singlet cortex communicates with the hippocampus, the amygdala, and your uh, striatum. So if you visualize it, you have your pregenital anterior singlet cortex. Um, if it has increased connectivity to your left central executive network, that makes you resilient. And of course, the interaction, the, in, the connections within the central executive network, but also whether that pre volunteer singlet cortex can tell to the sales network, um, I don't care about these stimuli. Um, I'm, not, uh, I'm, uh, I'm not overwhelmed by these stimuli. And where the sales network also has um, not... Uh, doesn't engage the central executive network constantly 
um, in order to solve minor problems. Now, when you get stressed, so when you get um, when you get a lot of information, then what happens is that causes, unfortunately, an atrophy, which is reversible of your pregenital singlet cortex, but also of your caudate, uh, your putamen, which is part of the, um, the striatum. And the striatum is uh, critically uh, involved in conditioning. Now, from a practical point of view, this, uh, if the stress is not maintained too long, this this uh, atrophy is reversible. So your pregenital anterior singlet cortex and your putamen can return back to normal if that stress is um, is not maintained for too long. Now, what happens in PTSD is that actually this pregenital anterior singlet cortex becomes atrophic. So, uh, but it comes irreversibly atrophic, and that changes its connectivity to uh, the salient network and central executive network. Um, so when there is no task, so when those patients, P PTSD patients are at rest, they're already connected to the salient and the central executive network as if they are. Um, so the, the activation of the salient network and central executive network is already there at rest when normally your default mode network should be at rest so you can rest and digest and restore. So those patients have no capacity to, re to rest and digest and restore. And strangely enough, when there is a task, so when they're exposed to, um, to a stressor, then they activate their default mode network, which could be then um, functioning as a kind of a freezing response. So from a, from a conceptual point of view at rest, these patients are already in stress. And, uh, and that's why it's called post-traumatic stress, of course. Um, and this is reflected in the brain networks um, that are then going to become atrophic in the, in the long run. So the, the salient network becomes atrophic and the central executive network shuts down. And this is what you see in PTSD. So uh, in PTSD, your pregenital anterior single uh, cortex is, um, is atrophic, as is your amygdala as is your striatum, so your conditioning, so you don't learn, you can't learn anymore. Um, and the, uh, the amount of atrophy actually correlates with the severity of the um, post-traumatic stress. So the incapacity to suppress irrelevant stimuli um, correlates with the PTSD. Now, so PTSD can be considered as conditioned fear, as learned fear. So, for example, if you have an office, um, that creates a specific context. Now, if you get bullied by a boss or if you get, um, get uh, repetitively maltreated, then you, of course, um, the problem is then is that this context becomes linked to a negative emotion, to, um, to the angry boss. And then in the future, it can become generalized. And then any office might actually create already a fear response um, that could that is associated with the trigger. So it's a, it's a conditioned response that is there um, in uh, PTSD. So if you look at it from a uh, from a learning point of view, actually, your your brain uh, creates a model of the world that is overfitted, where there is actually uh, parts of your model of the world that uh, are become linked to a um, to a stressor, and this um, this conditioning is caused by um, changes in the caudate and the putamen, and so when you learn something initially. Uh, when something is important, your salience network will activate your central executive network, as we've seen before. This will become linked to your default mode network. So what it means is that when you learn something, your uh, what you learn becomes part of your self-representational network. Um, and that will then activate your uh, sensory motor networks that become linked to your uh, caudate and putamen. Now, in the second stage of learning, what is uh, what happens is that your salience and, and the central executive network become disconnected from your default mode network. And basically, um, what you learned is just going to uh, trigger your default mode from your putamen and caudate. So your caudate and putamen uh, become linked to your default mode. But of course, if that is a traumatic condition reflex, then you, you're in trouble because it becomes part of who you are.
So this then allows you to um, to find that in uh, that reliving is associated um, and avoidance and um, a change in mood and cognition um, or the hyper arousal are all linked to similar uh, networks which involve the amygdala, the orbitofrontal cortex, and the pregenital anterior cingulate cortex. Um, so these different symptoms are um, can be ascribed to somewhat different interactions between those um, networks. Now, a problem is that when you um, are exposed to subliminal stimuli, meaning a stimulus that you can't, that is not pushed to consciousness, it can still activate your amygdala as its meta-analysis has shown. And that is then... Um, that will then activate the superior colliculus, goes to your pulvinar, which is your attentional uh, thalamic uh, uh, network, and that will then uh, result in a fear response. So basically, even if you're not consciously aware of those stimuli, because um, then they can still trigger a fear response. And the problem is, if, if this uh, fear response becomes um, occurs in, an, in a state of neuroinflammation, then that will turn fear into anxiety. And um, so we get the same idea. You've got, depending on your genetic buildup and your uh, previous history of psychological, physical stress uh, and current history of uh, psychological, physical stress, previous history of trauma or childhood adversity, that can then uh, make you vulnerable and anxiety uh, and fear becomes anxiety, but the same occurs for um, for trauma. So, if you have risk genes, as represented here in in um, in red, and you've got a very good childhood, once you've got um, a trauma, you develop PTSD or depression because you're exposed to risk genes. If you have no risk genes, so you've got a normal resilience network, but during childhood, you're exposed to trauma, then that might epigenetically modify these the same genes that are uh, risk genes. And then when you're exposed to a second hit, so an, a trauma later in life, that can result in PTSD. So the risk genes means that one trauma can result in PTSD, whereas if you have healthy genes then uh, and childhood adversity, then second uh, later traumas can also result in PTSD. And of course, if you have if you have risk genes and um, you have um, a trauma, then it becomes even worse. So from a practical point of view, there is uh, uh, certain genes uh, known to be um, present in patients with uh, PTSD um, that are related to the immune function, to how you respond to stress and to the nervous system that in combination with environmental factors lead to neuroinflammation that that um, will then result in changes in your um, in those uh, triple networks uh, as well as the uh, amygdala uh, extending to the orbitofrontal cortex. So now that we understand how PTSD develops, then the question is, how can we use that for treatment? So if you look at meta-analysis, of course, you can use psychological treatment. And the two treatments that uh, that that stand out um, of uh, from a psychological point of view in meta-analysis is EMDR and trauma-based uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. So they have the best um, outcomes of all the different kinds of psychological treatments that have been used for uh, PTSD. How does EMDR work? Well, uh, unsurprisingly, it, um, it increases the connectivity to the insula from the pregenital anterior singlet. So we know that the pregenital anterior singlet cortex is actually deficient in PTSD, um, as well as the um, amygdala, as well as the insula, um, as well as the putamen, that all of these areas are atrophic and dysfunctional. And EMDR apparently, uh, based on the meta-analysis, is capable of uh, regaining some of this inhibitory uh, capacity of the pregenital anterior cingulate cortex. Now, pharmacologically, um, looking at meta-analysis, SSRIs are the most prescribed um, drug. Uh, 
Um, you can also prescribe a uh, not just a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, but um, also a noradrenaline and serotonin like mirtazapine. Uh, tricyclics seem to work uh, somewhat antipsychotic and uh, prazosine. Um, now, there is no benefit of cannabinoids and of um, a lot of other drugs that have been tested. Uh, more recently, ketamine has, uh, has started to be used, um, and it seems to have um, a large effect size on PTSD. So we use it in the clinic as well, but only in patients who, um, who do not automutilate, because uh, the problem with ketamine is that they dissociate, and um, then they might actually start automutilating under ketamine. So this is the only contraindication for us to use ketamine for uh, PTSD. Now, uh, psychedelic enhanced psychotherapy is the, is the new kit on the block for um, treatments. Um, it seems to be um, very uh, highly um, efficacious. Um, where in three settings, um, uh, more than 70% uh, of the patients do seem to become um, PTSD free, at least according to, um, to the uh, classical um, criteria. Um, and the only um, uh, problem might be is that the, the standard treatment uh, for most uh, uh, GPs or uh, neurologists is to use SSRIs, and SSRIs may actually dampen the effect of the MDMA-assisted um, uh, psychotherapy. So that's something that uh, could be considered or should be considered when, um, when using um, uh, ecstasy assisted psychotherapy. You can also try and use modulation. There is meta-analytic evidence um, for, um, for RTMS. So uh, you can use uh, both um, 10 Hertz and one Hertz on the right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So this is a little mistake here. It should be right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex where actually hyper, uh, so uh, High frequency TMS is, seems to be better than low frequency, which intuitively makes sense because um, remember that the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex in PTSD is atrophic. So you want to activate it to be able to suppress your hippocampus um, and uh, therefore 10 Hertz uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex stimulation might be more um, uh, reasonable um, to uh, uh, to help. So how how well does it work? Well, if you have a uh, Cohen or Edges uh, uh, effect size of 0.9, that correlates with about uh, a number needed to treat of two patients. Um, so one out of two of your patients should benefit from RTMS. Um, for uh, TDCS, uh, there is not as much evidence. There, have, there has been a double-blind placebo-controlled study that does show that there is a, um, a benefit on the different uh, subscales of the, um, of the PCL5. Um, so it does seem to be beneficial as well, but there is no mental analytic evidence yet. And for neurofeedback, uh, there is only there has been one meta-analysis that uh, based that is based on four RCTs, which predominantly use alpha theta. Um, training um, or variants thereof with a large effect size. Um, but the problem is that due to the methodology of the studies, the, the certainty of the evidence is, um, is considered um, very low. So how do we treat it in, in our clinic in Belgium? Well, we, we go by uh, in two phases. In the first phase, we try to treat the PTSD uh, symptoms by combining psychological therapy with pharmacological um, and enhancement and neuromodulation. And of course, we try to treat both the brain, the endocrine system, as well as the immune system. And how do we do that pharmacologically? We give the ANXIT, which blocks your alpha-1 receptors, as well as your dopamine D1 receptors, um, which are increased. And um, we combine that with clonazepam, which... Uh, um, activates your GABA A, so your your break basically. We um, also give naltrexone, but low dose, five milligrams, which has been shown to be beneficial, especially if the patients with PTSD have associated um, addiction um, uh, or substance use disorder. 
And I personally add aripiprazole, um, but a very low dose, like one fifth of the lowest dose that's commercially available. Um, and aripiprazole has a um, has the right uh, receptor profile, especially on your serotonin receptors, to activate your pregenital and tear singlet cortex, as does naltrexone. For panic attacks in those patients, oxytocin no spray may be beneficial. Within one to one to two minutes, um, it can cut the the panic attack. It, we have not noticed a benefit by giving it uh, two or three times a day routinely for the um, for the PTSD itself, but it does seem to to benefit some patients with um, panic attacks. Although they, I could not find really any strong evidence for that in the literature. But of course, as you know, it's not because it hasn't been shown yet that it doesn't work. And then we we treat them um, with TMS as well. Um, in it, on the right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex uh, to treat predominantly the, the memory associated uh, problems and then uh, followed by left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex stimulation to increase the um, resilience um, afterwards. Um, we have not been using a lot of TDCS, um, but there has been not a lot of evidence for that yet either. Then for the endocrine system, we use clonidine. Clonidine blocks your, uh, modifies your alpha two receptors of your um, of your uh, sympathetic nervous system. So block uh, so that is in combination with the alpha one blocking. So your alpha uh, system is blocked. I we haven't used a lot of enderol, which could block your beta receptors of the sympathetic nervous system. This is something that theoretically could be added, even though the 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 literature is not that strong and we also try to modify the, uh, the immune system by giving naltrexone uh, the naltrexone that um, um, in, in low dose has an anti-inflammatory response as well as an acetylcysteine um, for which there is uh, some evidence that if you give it at uh, 1200 milligrams which means two uh, two tablets in the morning and in the evening that that might benefit um, your uh, PTSD as well. So by targeting uh, not just uh, one, one system, but the three systems, uh, we try to stabilize. If the patients improve, then of course, the, the second phase is how to prevent um, them from uh, relapsing and um, when they have any small, um, uh, small uh, problem. And, um, what we uh, want to start in the, in the future is to use microdosing. In um, Belgium, that is not yet available, but in the, in the Netherlands, it is. Uh, so microdosing um, is different from the SSRI and, um, of course, could be beneficial based on the current studies that are being done with, um, with ecstasy, um, but there is no evidence yet for it. Um, and we combine that with neurofeedback. Uh, we tend to use Loretta and for a slow neurofeedback um, where we try to rebuild the, um, the, the triple network by training the, uh, the pregenital and tear singlet and PCC um, predominantly because the pregenital and tear singlet is the, uh, the, one of the major uh, deficient hubs in the brain. Um, so we, we, tr we train the coherence between those two. Um, using Mark Smith's programs. And um, then the, after that, after we try to rebuild the medial part of the default mode, um, we then uh, do uh, extend this by uh, a second program, which anti-correlates with the insula and the dorsal anterior singlet cortex. And then in a third phase, you can retrain the central executive network. And uh, pharmacologically, um, the what we in the in the second phase what uh, we do is we uh, we taper down the medication that we have here and we keep it at the lowest dose that is comfortable for um, the patients. So in summary, and in conclusion, uh, PTSD is the result of um, ultimately of a deficient resilience network, um, which is caused by genetic and epigenetic influences. Um, on how your brain uh, processes uh, trauma and stress. It involves the pregenital and tear singlet, um, amygdala, hippocampal, putamen network that then uh, influences your uh, interactions uh, in 
and within and between the triple networks and um, engages the, um, the emotional over the frontal cortex linked to the amygdala. Uh, the problem is that these uh, genetic and epigenetic influences actually induce a neuroinflammation, which turns uh, fear, uh, uh, sorry, fear and trauma into uh, post-traumatic stress um, disorder. And of course, then based on this knowledge, you can try de and develop treatments that consist of treating not just the brain, but also the endocrine and the immune system, including psychotherapy, um, pharmacology and neuromodulation. And I would assume that if you combine those treatments that uh, even though there is no hard evidence yet that that should be theoretically better than only focusing on one of, um, of the different treatment aspects uh, for, the, for patients, especially those ones with complex uh, PTSD who do not only have the, the, the simple PTSD problems, but also have problems of um, emotional uh, dysregulation and interpersonal or social um, complications because of their PTSD. And I thank you for your attention. Dirk, that has been an absolutely brilliant lecture. I know uh, many of us in the background have absolutely been a buzz with the information you have shared and how you've pulled all that together. And there is just so much learning. I think uh, some of us are going to be delving through uh, this, this information that you've shared uh, and to really bring it on board. Uh, I'd really like to thank you for sharing all that brilliant uh, uh, info with us. Now, we've run uh, over time by a little bit, but I'm sure everybody will feel it's been well worth it. And um, I'd like to open up um, for just a couple of quick questions. So um, if uh, anybody's um, got something that they'd like to ask of Dirk and his presentation, please uh, put your hand up uh, and uh, let, um, let's hear from you. Um, Dirk, yes. this is this Uh We had a discussion with you, um, I think, a few couple of years ago about the role of meditation. Um, yeah. I, I think there's um, something very strong about the, you haven't mentioned that uh, the mindfulness meditation and the Buddhist. Yes. Uh, yeah, yes. yeah. No, I, I and that's a very good remark. I should have put that in in the in the talk. Meditation is actually capable of strengthening that. Uh, I think there was there was just a, it was just men mentioned in one slide that meditation can actually strengthen the pregenital anterior singlet function, and if you can if you can bring that back online so that it can suppress um, further input of sensory stimuli then of course that is um, that is very very beneficial in preventing this uh, becoming overwhelmed um, from any stimulus to trigger that um, that uh, stress response because your your system is already in in that uh, salience and central executive network activity and any stimulus that can be suppressed by um, which is trained by mindfulness uh, meditation is of course beneficial and mindfulness meditation has shown to be able to activate this pre um uh, cortex um, activity so no it's a good question and um, uh, it is it is it is beneficial thank you Dirk. anybody Dirk. else want to yeah. throw a question in. Might jump in, George, thanks. Uh, brilliant presentation. Uh, Dirk, I was wondering with the psychedelic and ketamine treatment, if you screen clients for any suspicious EEG activity or epileptiform and how that informed that intervention? Yes, so, um, well, any every patient that comes to our clinic, of course, gets an EEG, like I assume in, in, in most of your clinics. Um, for ketamine, um, we have, as I said, uh, for PTSD, we have only one contraindication. If there's no, uh, 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 we would not take seizures even as a contraindication, but we would not use 10 hertz TMS in somebody who has risky, who has some signs of uh, 
who has epileptic RAFO elements that would that would suggest there is epilepsy. So the only clinical contraindication is automutilation. Initially, we didn't do that because it was not published, uh, but we had two patients who actually brought um, um, a sharp instrument to start automutilating while they were um, um, under, um, under ketamine. So we stopped uh, doing that. Um, uh, another problem with ketamine is that um, the patients really lose control uh, over their over their brain, and that's of course for someone with PTSD extremely difficult because their whole system is based on getting control over the situation constantly. So you really have to build a trust relationship with the patients where they trust you um, that they will not leave, um, that they will not be able to control their brain. Um, the so that's that's for um epilepsy for um psychedelics um as i said we 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 don't we can't use uh um large doses of uh, psychedelics so we can't do unfortunately we can't do psychedelic assisted uh, psychotherapy now for um psy psilocybin which is freely available in the netherlands um, there is basically only one real contraindication that's people who have um, not borderline personality, but who have bipolar disorder. If they have, if they are depressed and they have a history of bipolar disorder, then if you give psychedelics, they the risk is that they overshoot into mania. That's the only real contraindication for psychedelics and and um, and. Uh, and high doses, but this is known to be correlated to the um, dose. So with microdosing, normally you don't risk that overshooting into a manic uh, episode. We've only suggested patients with PTSD who, who were somewhat better with the, with the combined approach that we provide to uh, say, look, um, uh, the micro the microdosing has been suggested to um, and to be able to uh, increase active coping, so makes them makes them more stress resilient, um, basically. Uh, and so we have a couple of patients who go to the Netherlands and buy their microdoses, where they take one gram of uh, psilocybin uh, once every three days, which might not be sufficient for PTSD patients. Um, so the the one the one gram every three days is um, comes from um, actually experience and people who want to boost their creativity or, or, and their their work capacity rather than for trauma for trauma they might need to take a little bit more. Um, the reason why it's available in the Netherlands is because there is a strange um, um, gap in the in the Dutch law where um, you can't sell. Anything that's above the ground, um, so the the magic mushrooms themselves you can't sell, but the truffles, the part that's um, underneath the ground, you are allowed to sell, and they pay taxes, which is very good uh, on what they sell, which means that the quality can be can be uh, trusted. And so, um, I'm meeting with people next week who actually um, checked the the dose because the problem um, with the psilocybin. Um, on uh, the the mushroom part that's on top of the earth is that the, that the amount of psilocybin inside is very variable. So um, and that's of course for macrodose and critical because if you don't if if it would be one tenth of the normal dose and you already give one tenth of the of the psychedelic dose, then you end up with giving nothing. Um, so uh, there is some practicality, uh, still practical problems um, with um, with dosing. So ideally, you would use synthetic, but that's not available. Synthetic psilocybin is not available, so we can't currently use it as a, as a drug, unfortunately. Very interesting. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dirk. Um, and if I have a no... question, Martin. Dirk, you mentioned oxytocin nasal spray as a panic attack rescue uh, medicine. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the dosage? So what I uh, what I propose is to do two puffs in the left nose and two puffs in the in the right dose uh, in the right nostril. Sorry, um, but some patients get away with one, uh, just one puff left and right. 
but I, I usually suggest to start with two puffs in the left nostril and two puffs in the in the right nostril. And the, the, the beauty of it is that works very, very quickly, not in everybody, but um, especially in, in, of course, and that's good for PTSD, uh, for social, um, for social, um, trig socially triggered panic attacks. Okay, then what's the concentration of the oxytocin? Oh, I'd have to look it up because in, in the Netherlands, I have to order it in the Netherlands. There is only one uh, one concentration. I would I can I can send it to you, but I'd have to look it up because um, I just prescribed. There is only one version in the Netherlands. Okay, here we would need a compounding pharmacist to get it. Okay, no, in the Netherlands, it's 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 there is a there is only one version, so that makes it easy. But you I know I the can brand. Look at, Do you know the brand name? Then I can look it up. Uh, no, I I just prescribe uh, literally oxytocin no spray, um, and I I remember that in, initially I looked up the dose, but I can't remember. But I can I can forward that to you if you want. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Well, uh, Dirk, again, thank you very much for uh, coming on board. It's always a pleasure to um, hear from you and uh, you've always got some something uh, fascinating to share with our team and uh, we all have uh, something to learn. So uh, thank you for your time.